It's really a pleasure and an honor to have you all here. Uh, so many old friends in the room, a few new ones, but many old ones. Uh, this is the what number, GEM meeting? Number eight. So this is our number eight meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, this is an opportunity for us to showcase uh, some of the work we've done uh, over the last year or so and, and to engage with uh, people that are helping extend the frontiers of knowledge in related ways. Um, I'm um, going to make a brief introduction as to, to explain a little bit how we understand development, how we think about the problem, and to make some sense of why we've scheduled the meetings that we have, the sessions that we have. Because um, uh, you might believe that we did it by, uh, in a random manner otherwise. <laughs> Anyway, so the, sec the, the, the question that motivates us is why are there so many poor countries and poor places in the world? Why isn't everywhere prosperous? And to answer that question, we have to go back to our founding father, right, Adam Smith, who asked the question, what is the secret of the wealth of nations? Now, when he wrote his book, you know, the wealthiest country in the world, which is probably the Netherlands, was about four times richer than the poorest country in the world, which was subsistence. Today, the poorest country in the world is Malawi. If you multiply by four the income per capita of Malawi, you get to Haiti. If you multiply by four the income per capita of Haiti, you get to Morocco. If you multiply by four the income per capita of Morocco, you get to Poland or Argentina. If you multiply by four the income per capita of Poland, you get to Singapore. So a problem that was four to one has become a problem of 256 to one. We know why it happened. It happened because incomes were stagnant forever in the world, and suddenly about 200 years ago, they started to go up. And something that looks like a hockey stick. But when you zoom into that hockey stick, this stuff happened first in some parts of the world than in others. So that gaps that were small before have now exploded. And the question for us is to figure out how can we make people participate in that prosperity. Now, there are plenty of theories and flavors of the month and new approaches and so on out there. And I guess one of the dominant these days is that it's all institutions. And you know, it, uh, there's obviously something to the story because this is a picture of the world at night. I don't know if you recognize it, but uh, this is zooming into the Korean Peninsula. And you can pretty much realize where the border between systems is by just looking at, uh, at uh, the lights at night, right? Uh, and, you know, this has been a, sort of like an evolving agenda and saying, you know, uh, the fundamental difference between the wealth of nations is in the institutions. And our colleagues, uh, Darren Asimoglu and, and, and Jim Robinson, start their book on why nations fail, comparing Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Sonora. And uh, we believe that there must be something to that story but there's a hell of a lot more that explains development. Because if you look not at the difference between Nogales, Arizona and Nogales, Sonora, but if you look at differences within Mexico, you will find that you know, one of the poorer parts of Mexico is the state of Guerrero, where productivity per worker is about $5,000. You multiply by two the productivity of the state of Guerrero and you get to the state of Sinaloa. Sinaloa has a productivity similar to that of Jamaica. Guerrero has a productivity similar to that of Honduras. You multiply by two Sinaloa, you get to the state of Guanajuato. It has a productivity like that of Malaysia. You multiply by two the state of Guanajuato, you get to the state of Nuevo León, which has a productivity slightly higher than that of Korea. So that means that with the same constitution, the same laws, the same banking system, the same exchange rate, the same inflation rate, the same interest rate, the same many, many, many things, you have humongous differences in productivity at the state level. 
If you were to look at the municipal level, you'd find even larger differences in productivity. So there has to be something beyond institutions, or at least these national level institutions to explain these huge differences. So in essence, we're asking the question, why are some people making things this way if you could make things this way? And economists have, for a while, had an answer to this question. It says, well, you know, essentially it's because these people here are using more land, they're using maybe more labor, they're using more capital, and they're maybe using more schooling, more human capital. And you know, work on development has found out that essentially this is not the explanation, that you cannot account for these 256 factor differences in incomes per capita by looking at factor endowments. Actually, you can explain why people don't acquire these factors by something else. And that something else people believe is technology. Now, technology is a term that um, should have been invented by diplomats because it's the perfect word to hide your disagreements, almost like institutions, right? If you say, oh, it's institutions, anybody can mean whatever they mean by it because we don't know what the word is. Technology is supposed to be the way people do things and the things they do them with and so on, so it's not obvious what people exactly mean. But I think if you decompose technology, technology is really made out of three things. And one of those things is tools. No, it's the things we do things with, right? And they embody a lot of knowledge. Another thing that technology is, is codes. It's blueprints, it's how-to manuals. Call that also codified knowledge. Now, tools can be put on containers and shipped around. And it doesn't take 200 years to get to Malawi. So it cannot be that the problem of Malawi is that they didn't get the container. Codes can be shipped even faster, put them on the web. So it's very hard to explain these humongous differences in, in income as differences in technology caused because of the tools didn't go there or the, the codes didn't get there. The problem is that to implement technology, you need something besides tools and codes. And you realize that when you ask yourself the question, what do you do when your tooth hurts? You can obviously ask your significant other to download an article from the web. But um, I, I don't advise it. <laughs> I think you should go see an expert. And an expert is somebody who may use tools, who may use protocols, but that expert has some know-how in his head that allows him to deploy those tools and those codes. And that know-how exists only in his brain. It doesn't have any other instantiation than a certain wiring of the brain. Leslie Valiant would say that's where the thing gets computed. Now, the brain is a remarkable thing, and this know-how is really a very weird thing. Because we think we have brains, but the truth is that the brains have us. And we, this sense of us, we have this self, is one of the many things that our brains do for us. And, and the things that our brain knows how to do are not things we understand. Say. For example, Rafa Nadal knows how to answer a serve. I don't know that a physicist could figure out how he does it, because you can imagine no, the physics of it is just astonishing. His brain does. He doesn't. And so he has a lot of trouble explaining it to you how he does it. But I can sort of, I feel relatively secure in saying that if he does achieve to explain it to you, your tennis game is not going to improve much. <laughs> so that is the sense in which this know-how is this funny substance that exists only in brains and moving it around is complicated. And the problem with modern technology is not, it's not just that it's know-how in brains, is that it's know-how in teams. In teams of complementary people who know different things and who need to collaborate to implement that technology. As I like to say, anesthesiologists working by themselves 
are not, met, not much better than a lousy economics lecturer at putting people to sleep, <laughs> right? So he needs to collaborate with other people. It needs to be some kind of parallel computing in the ability to master and deploy this know-how to mobilize tools and things. Now, it's very important that we're going to say that the difference in know-how between countries is what drives their difference in income and their differences in growth and so on. So we have to understand what, how to compare know-how. How do you compare know-how across societies? So therefore, I want to compare an, one of the First Nations. I, this is an Inuit, and this is an Inuit engaged in food production. And this is the Inuit engaged in housing construction. And this is the Inuit engaged in transportation. Joseph Hendrich, who's going to uh, talk to us later on, is, he has some beautiful stories about how the Inuits were somewhat smarter than the people who were exploring the North Pole or who were trying to get to the Northwest Passage. But here is the Inuit, and I want to compare him with modern man. And the question is, who has more know-how? And you clearly see that that question is meaningless. Because modern man is what my wife, who's here, eh, describes me, I think appropriately. She says, he's quite useless. <laughs> eh. You know, he uses glasses, doesn't know how to make glasses. He uses shirts, doesn't know how to make shirts. He uses computers, doesn't know how to make computers. Eh, if you put this man here, we can scientifically prove that he will not survive, right? Either because he'll freeze to death or because he'll starve to death. So there's no practical sense in which you can say that this man has more know-how than this guy's. But it, is, it does make sense to say that this society has more know-how than this society because they simply know how to do more things. But it's not because Everybody in the society knows how to do everything. The more primitive the society, the more complete the copy of the technology of the society in every person's head. There's less division of know-how between heads. Right? So everybody in the Inuit community probably knows how to hunt, how to make an igloo, how to run a, a dog sled. There, a lot of the technology is in one head. We cannot do that. We have too much technology to put in a single head, and therefore we have to diffuse that know-how across many heads, and then later on bring these heads together uh, to cooperate. So one way of asking yourself how much know-how is in something is to ask yourself how many people need to collaborate to make something. So this is the produce of an Ecuadorian family. And this Ecuadorian family made all these products here. So the know-how needed to make these things resides in this family. I have yet to meet a family that knows how to make these products. And you might say that I don't know any country that knows how to make this product. The know-how necessary to make this product is spread out, out, out in a huge network of different organizations that know how to do different things. And you need to bring all these organizations together. It doesn't, it's not enough to have Boeing with 165,000 employees to make one of these things. With 165,000 employees, they make 10 to 15% of the parts that go into making the airplane. And it's not that you need a lot of people to make a lot of airplanes. You need a lot of people to make one airplane. The first airplane needs all those people. So that gives you a sense of how intense is the amount of know-how that has to be embedded in the product. Now, that doesn't mean that organizations have to be big. There are organizations can be big but they may not be mobilizing a lot of know-how. This is a company that uh, probably uses people in very similar tasks. So everybody's using the same bit of know-how. And you realize because you can shuffle them around and nothing much happens to the production process. You cannot do that experiment here. You cannot put people around and expect the same result. They're playing different things. They're uh, incorporating different bits of know-how into their story. So we've summarized this in what we call the Scrabble theory of development. The Scrabble theory of development says that things are like words. Products are like words. 
They're made by putting letters together, like bits of know-how together. And you know, if you have just one kind of word, there are not too, not too many, one kind of letter, there are not too many words you can put together. But if you have these three letters, you can put together four words and you can put together three letter words. If I give you an extra letter, now you can make nine words and you can make four letter words. If I give you these 10 letters, you can make 595 words and you can make longer words. So as I give you more letters, you can make more words and you can make longer words. So the diversity of what you make goes up and the complexity of what you make goes up. So those are things that we can look at. We cannot necessarily see the letters, but we can see the diversity of the things you do and the complexity of the things you do. So let's go back to this picture and ask ourselves, what's the difference between this guy and this guy? Who has more know-how? Well, this guy knows how to make his own seeds. He knows how to make his own fertilizer. He probably knows how to make his own tools. This guy uses a tractor he hasn't a clue how to make, that uses gasoline that he doesn't have a clue how to find and process and make. He has this, you know, genetically modified seeds that he doesn't know what it means. He uses you know, agrochemicals, he uses a bunch of stuff that he does not know how to make. But he is mobilizing all that know-how in his production. So that is what's underpinning these huge differences in productivity. It's not the tools, it's not the codes, it's the sum of the three, but the one that is difficult to move is the know-how. We can take this to the data and ask ourselves how many things you do and how hard are is to do the things you do. The first approximation of how hard it is to do the things you do is to ask how many other countries are able to do what you do. So when you take that to the data, we can measure these things and, you know, countries line perfectly. Rich countries make a lot of things and things few other countries are able to do and poor countries make few things and things that everybody is able to do. And you can take that subnationally to municipalities in Chile. Well, here is Santiago. Here's where the penguins live. Uh, to Turkey. To states of Mexico. To cities of Mexico. To departments of Colombia. So now we have an anchor of how to measure how much know-how is embedded in the social networks that societies use to produce. So we've used that to calculate an economic complexity index for the world. And we've also used that to calculate an economic complexity index to each municipality in Mexico. Okay? And tomorrow we'll see that this has an enormous explanatory power on things we really care about. We know that the amount of letters that you have, this variable I have here, is strongly related to how rich you are. Countries that have more letters that are more diversified and make harder things are richer than countries that are less. But not only is that true, what is true also is that to the extent that this theory is not, a, is not right, to the extent that not all points line along the line, it is actually informative. It's not just an error of the theory, it is informative. You know, India, for example, is way below the regression line. This would say, India, how are you so poor if, if you know so much? Well, guess what? India is growing fast. So maybe India is growing where it belongs because it already has what it takes to be richer than it is. It just needs to diffuse it more in its society. Here is Greece. This theory says, Greece, what the hell are you doing up there? You don't belong there. You, are, you know too little to be so rich. Well, guess what? You know, Greece is having trouble sustaining that position. Right? So these differences are actually informative of future growth, and we've shown that they are predictive of future growth, that countries tend to converge to a level of income that they can support with their know-how. So how do economies learn? Well, to learn, they need to solve a chicken and egg problem of how it is that you, that you, so you have to start doing things you didn't do before, but to do something, you have to know how to do it, but you don't know how to do the things you don't do. So how do you solve that problem? And the answer that we have found is that societies tend to solve that problem by moving to nearby goods, to goods that are not too many letters away. So our metaphor has been, as you know, that goods are like trees in a forest. 
And what we need to understand is the shape of that forest. So we know where the trees are. So uh, we know, you know two trees with very similar letters are going to be in, a, in the same part of the forest. And we've mapped that out in what we call the product space. And the product space is sort of like the shape of that forest. And once we have uh, the space of the forest, we can find out where countries have their capabilities. So a country now is just a set of monkeys that populate parts of the forest. So they, it's companies that exploit certain products. And we can map them. So for example, this is Venezuela. That's where Venezuela had monkeys back in 2013. And this is Mexico. And you immediately see that Mexico just has much more know-how than Venezuela. They're able to put together much more complicated things than Venezuela. So you know, if you look at Venezuela, this is the export package of Venezuela. This is the export package of Mexico. There's just so much more that Mexico is good at. Uh, we can see monkeys jumping over time. Let me show you just Thailand in, in time. So this is Thailand in 65, in 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 2000, 2005, 2010. You see the monkeys moving and populating the forest. To, for us, that's important because it's saying that companies tend to move from the things they know how to do now, countries move from the things they know how to do now to things that are nearby in this space. Since we know where they are, we know the feasible transitions. We know the adjacent possible. So we can help the monkeys orient themselves in this maze where they could potentially go. So this is the transformation that happened in Thailand. It was essentially raw materials, agricultural products, and they essentially transformed themselves dramatically into producing many more things that were not there before. So the process of development is the process of learning how to do new things. That's why we're going to talk about learning in different perspectives. Because development, the level of development is your level of know-how. Developing means increasing your know-how. It means learning. Why are people moving to cities? Well, essentially, because it's easier to mix letters in cities than it is if the letters are spread apart. So this business of having goods that are more intensive in know-how means networks that are bigger creates increasing economies of agglomeration. And that's why humans have been agglomerating. And that's why we're going to have a session tomorrow with Ed Glazer, um, um, uh, Sergio Fajardo, uh, uh, and others to talk about how to manage this process, the benefits of agglomeration without the perils of, of, uh, of congestion. We are also going to discuss what makes growth non-inclusive. Uh, why, why is it so hard to, make a, to grow without increased inequality? And that has to do with the fact that the places that have many letters can be rich. But as I showed you before, if you're going to have an extra letter, you better put it in a place that has many letters. Because if you put an extra letter in a place that has many letters, you have many more possible combinations. So there, therefore, you'll try to put more letters in the same places. And those places are going to grow exponentially. And they're going to separate from the places that have few letters. Because if a place has few letters, why would you put an extra letter there? So some of the basic letters is, you know, Say you have to connect to, say, networks of goods like water, right? So this is one way of transporting water. This may be another way to transport water, right? Uh, but uh, to transport water this way, you need to pay some fixed cost of connecting to that network. This is one way of transporting energy. This is another. But it takes some fixed cost to connect to this network. This is one way of going to work, right? This is another. Right? But if you're going to go to work this way, you'll have to pay some fixed cost to do that. So the ability to connect people to the inputs that will make them productive implies paying some fixed cost. But if you're poor, you may not be rich enough or it doesn't pay to pay the fixed cost to connect you. But if you don't connect them, they're unproductive and hence poor. And that is the machine that we're fighting against in order to make growth more inclusive. Even within cities, uh, this comes from research from our uh, graduate uh, PhD student, uh, Sebastian Bustos, on Santiago, 
where we now with big data, we can figure out how costly really it is to go to work and why so many Chileans are not going to work, right? That it is just too costly to connect to the possibility of mixing your letters. So this is happening at many scales. And you know, non-inclusiveness then looks like this, right? So we are learning from big data. And uh, that's part of the revolution that we're living through. So big data uh, is what's making some of the most valuable companies in the world very valuable, so valuable that people now worry, right? Uh, but we are trying to ride that wave uh, with our partners, MasterCard and Telefonica, which have shared their data with us to, for us to try to extend frontiers of knowledge. And we'll share some of the research we're doing on their data in the next couple of days. How do you move know-how from one place to another? Well, it's really hard to get know-how into brains. Try becoming as good as Rafa Nadal. But it's much easier to move brains. So the mobility of brains has very much to do with the mobility of technologies over time. So when people move, they bring their brains with them. They have trouble avoiding it. <laughs> and once they are there, then others can imitate and learn from them. But the diffusion of technology has a lot to do with, the, with mobility. And so we're going to have a session on migration and technological diffusion. And it's going to be somewhat of a counterpoint in a world that is obsessed about the risk of refugees and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, we will present some evidence, interesting evidence, uh, from Albania, for example, uh, where we have studied the impact of return migration on, on, uh, on, on the welfare of the locals. So now, that immediately uh, leads us to ask a question, OK, so if learning is so central, how can we learn about what learning means and what the learning process is? And how does nature uh, deal with that? So machine learning is now sort of, you might think, eliminating the human aspect of, of, uh, of, uh, of the learning process. But actually, uh, our next speaker, Leslie Valiant, who, by the way, I'll introduce him now. He's a, he's a winner of the Turing Award, the Turing Award is for computer science what the Nobel Prize is for, uh, for the rest of us. Uh, but um, they tell me that the Turing Award is harder to win than the economics Nobel Prize. So, so, and what he's doing is he's trying to learn what these algorithms have to do with, um, with uh, uh, how nature learns, how the mind works, and so on. And uh, Joseph Henrich is going to tell us how learning happens not at the individual level, but at the societal level. How humans have evolved to be very capable of learning, to be geared at learning, uh, learning at the societal level through cultural evolution. And he's going to tell us a little bit about how he sees uh, the secret of, of our success as a species so that maybe uh, we can learn from that whole literature when we try to think of uh, making countries more successful. Thank you very much. <laughs>